Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I haven't presented this session in over a year because uh, I wasn't sure how to do it virtually. So hopefully uh, I will not stumble around too much. Um, but I have on here that it's for summer projects, but really video production can be utilized across the curriculum any time of the year. And student projects uh, really can become more dynamic when you incorporate this. Also, everybody is now producing their own content because of phones and things like that. So it's important to uh, share with students the responsibility that goes along with telling stories in this format. So I'm going to move on to my next slide which is um, the process. So the video production process is much like the writing process, except you're telling stories with pictures and sounds as opposed to just using words. So instead of pre-writing and drafting and editing, we've got pre-production, production, and post-production, which is also editing. Um, and in the process, today we're going to talk mostly about the middle one, the production. Um, the post-production editing is a completely different workshop, so uh, if you're interested, we can do an editing session. But um, pre-production is much like what you do when you pre-write. So you have to um, kind of brainstorm for ideas, you have to know um, what your objective is going to be, you need to identify the audience. Uh, and you also have to research. There's a lot of research that goes into video production planning. Um, also, you have a script or a storyboard, which is the plan to carry forward. That goes to every person who is involved in the production uh, to help keep everybody on track. So I'm going to show a quick video um, by our own Renee Shaw in which she's talking about the importance of research. A lot of times students just want to dig in and start producing immediately and not consider the importance of the audience and the research. But I'm going to show you this video and it will load pretty fast. Okay. But one of the things you have to research, research, research. If, if you don't like to read, then doing this for a living may not be uh, what you should choose, right? I mean, because you're always reading about a lot of different things. And sometimes you're talking to people who you might not immediately think you have an interest in, right? And so I think just uh, trying to find out a lot of things about them, not just about their profession or their discipline, but about them. I think when I approach my shows, you know, Okay, I'm having uh, bandwidth issues for some reason. That's so strange because that doesn't usually happen with me. I don't use video a lot, though, when I'm doing workshops. Um, let me shrink it down and see if that helps. By the fact that you take the time not just to read their work, but to listen to interviews they've done somewhere else, you know, to maybe watch them in ballroom dancing, or you heard about um, a conversation they had with a friend that they love Comic Con, you know, and so you, you really go to those other places where it's not just about what this person does, but it's about who this person is, that you're not just focusing on. Mm -hmm. And as David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, once wrote, he said, you know, we focus so much on our resume, which what we f should be focusing on is our eulogy. So I think what I try to do is say, you know, here's your resume, which is fantastic, and the reason why I'm talking to you. But I really want to know, how would you want to be eulogized? How do you want to be remembered? And what kind of impact do you think you've made with your work and with the life you've lived? And I think if you get to that with a person, then that's the best. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Um, that's pretty much the end anyway. But uh, anyway, it can be about, not just about a person, but the research, your topic. Maybe you have students who are working on um, something that is historical in your town and they want to do a documentary about it. And so the research is so crucial uh, in order to have the right information pass along. So um, then we have I, I, I want to go back to the audience because the um, audience is so important. You have to think about the background. What kind of background information does your audience need to know in order to um, understand your story? So maybe not everybody who's watching, you've posted your video on your website. Maybe not everybody is from your town. So showing that on the map is important. Or um, 
even just thinking about uh, certain cultural aspects. It's all very, very important to keep your audience clued in so that they can follow the story and not have any distractions because distractions are what you really need to avoid. Um, age. Age is very important when you think about audience. You're going to write a completely different <clears throat> sounding script for an elementary audience than you would a high school audience. So considering that, thinking about vocabulary, sometimes you need to define a word. Um, using the lower thirds to show how to spell a word is important. Um, so the audience information, what's going to mo motivate your audience, what kind of um, video are you going to create that appeals to your audience by look and sound and pace, all of that is so important. So once you've researched your uh, topic and you've gotten your audience figured out, um, you are going to either plan with a script or a storyboard. So a script is all text and it's the video and the audio and the, this slideshow is going to be available for to you um, and all of these links are available you can download these to use with students or your own productions if you want but basically um, when you're planning you think about the video and the audio for each scene so you've got to match it up what is it going to look like and what it's going to sound like and this is usually um, when we're getting into career roles uh, this is a producer role with the script writer um, so I wanted to point that out you can go ahead and grab that template but then and a script is used for quick turnaround, like the news or something where you're not going to have a lot of scene changes. Maybe it's an interview, but you do want to include B-roll, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. A storyboard is for longer term productions where you're going to have a lot more scene changes um, and also a lot of, and it looks kind of like this. I pulled up this video about storyboarding. Uh, I don't think I'm going to show it right now. We might go back to showing it. Um, let me, I'm going to have to plug in my, uh, and my ethernet. Hold on just a second. Cause it's in, it's right over here. <laughs> and I apologize. I hadn't thought about that because I've never, well, it's been a long time since I've needed to plug in. Okay, that should be better. So sorry about that. So um, maybe now I could try playing this video about uh, storyboarding. And these are a couple of KET folks as well who've um, worked on several KET productions. But anyway, storyboard uh, is kind of like a comic strip. You're going to say see a video, um, so you're going to show what the person's going to see. It's just a quick drawing. It's not art or anything like that. It's just something so that the video is represented, and then you'll have the um, audio to go along with it. So, so planning for a stop animation is very important, and uh, something that Alice and I do is storyboarding. And storyboarding is basically just writing out what you're going to be doing. We use a worksheet that has squares and lines underneath um, across the page so that you can draw in the squares what's going to be happening in the animation, and then underneath we can write a little bit about um, how we're going to get that to happen. And also, if you're going to have a narration to it, it helps students um, to write that narration before you start the animation. And you know, that also factors into helping students build on their writing skills. It's another way to get that involved and also doing something really cool in the animation. Okay, so they're talking about animation, um, and that's a good time to use a storyboard. Most of the time in school projects, you're probably going to use um, a script, but a storyboard is good practice for students as well. And uh, animation is a lot of fun. We're going to get into the stop motion animation in a little bit. 
Uh, you finish the pre-production process by casting and auditions, and that's where you're going to pull in the director as well, who's going to be in charge of the whole production process. So I'm going to move on to talk about production. One of the most important things you need to think about is lighting. So a very affordable, um, probably the easiest lighting setup if you're going to have kind of a studio setup where you don't have a lot of natural light to help illuminate your subject. It's called th uh, three-point lighting. So you have a key light, which is the greatest source of light, uh, and that is going to come in a kind of a 90-degree angle, 45 above or, or lower, to fill in um, the side of the face or the side of your subject. Uh, the fill light's going to come in, and it's going to decrease the shadows from the other side, but it's not going to be as strong of a light as the key light. And then you have a backlight that actually comes down to the back, points to the back of the person's head, and that separates that person from your backdrop. It is a really effective way of um, illuminating your 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 talent, your subject, uh, for both video and photos. So if you're a photographer, this is a great way to um, pull in light for your um, studio as well. I'm going to play another video, and this one is of one of KET's former um, videographers, producer, director. His name's uh, Frank Simconis, and he talks about light. One, th one thing I would recommend with working with light is don't fight it. A lot of people try and overlight, and, and it, it never looks as good as if you just use what you have. Um, if you're doing an interview and you have to shoot it by a window and the, there's no way you can stop the sun from coming in, try and use that in some way. You might be able to block it a little bit and diffuse it, but you know, use it as a backlight or a side light or even your key light, depending on how big the room is. Work with what you have. Um, if you're outside, use the trees for, for shade. It, it, you know, it might give you a perfect diffused lighting that you're not even thinking about. Um, wor work with what you have. Don't always try and fight against what, what you have because you're going to get a much better product if you use what's there. And it's going to look a lot more natural, too, most of the time. Okay. Pause it there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I want to get into, oh, um, well, this is more lighting advice. Uh, hopefully it will work um, later. It's just another video. It's a little longer, so I was kind of not going to share it anyway, um, but we'll go back to it later if anybody has any questions about lighting. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about camera moves. So there are different types of moves that you're going to want to work uh, through with your students and their times to use them. So panning is if I had a tripod and my camera's on the tripod, if I move the camera, if I just swivel forward and back um, or back and forth, it's a pan, left and right. And then if I move it up and down, that's tilting. So you pan, you tilt, and then if it's on a dolly and... It's really fun in the Media Lab because I get to demonstrate this because I have all these things and I get to show it. But a dolly is where you're physically moving the whole setup, like you see this camera on a dolly, forward and back. And then trucking, this, this dolly probably wouldn't work very well unless the camera could move. It's side to side. So you're physically moving the whole setup when you dolly and truck. And then when you zoom in, you move the the zoom, you select the T button, which stands for telephoto, and that gets it into a tighter shot. And the W is the wide. And we're going to talk about when to use those shots in a second. Um, and the handheld camera work, uh, if, you, if you don't have a tripod, and sometimes when you're um, in a production or shooting for a production, you don't have the means to actually have a tripod. Some places just aren't a good spot for a tripod. So if you hold the camera really close to your body um, and you support the weight of the camera with your body, you're going to have a much more stable image. So if you have to pan, you just turn at the waist. And if you have to tilt, then you bend 
forward and back. And that way you can actually pan and tilt just doing handheld work. Now, walking forward, yes, you can do that. Um, I don't recommend it. I, tr I think it's uh, important to think about stopping the production so you can get a closer angle if you need to or to come closer or get further away. Um, but that is all a judgment that you would use on the set. So pan, tilt, dolly, truck, zoom. Uh, and also, um, I don't recommend with today's tech for well, the phones or um, tablets or even with handheld camcorders that you utilize the zoom during the production. I recommend that you use the zoom to set up shots in between recordings because um, that can be a little unstable. So if you hit the T too hard, uh, it might zoom in too fast and you don't want to always do that. So I would recommend dollying and trucking for those situations um, and zooming to set up the shots in between. Okay, so I wanna talk about focusing framing and composing. Um, so you see, this is what I would see through my viewfinder and you put this tic-tac-toe grid up and that helps guide you. It's called the rule of thirds. So um, there are, if you think about the rule of thirds, you take the screen and you divide it into thirds. Two thirds of your shot needs to have um, interest, be part of your subject, okay? One third can be negative space. So if you think about it that way, it could be the right two thirds of your screen, um, the left two thirds, the top or the bottom. The main part of the rule of thirds though is where those lines intersect. That's where your focal point should be. It should not be right in the center. The center is kind of boring. Also, if you're going to be, um, you don't want to shoot straight on. You want it to have a little bit of an angle to help create more depth of field and perspective. Now those are very important, the depth of field. You want to actually, you know, this is kind of two dimensional, so we need to create the third dimension. So the best way to do that is create a perspective. And I always talk to students about this because uh, because it's, it's kind of fun to talk about and the students have fun thinking about it. Um, you know, when you're standing by the side of the road, I talk about the vanishing point. As the road gets further away from you, it looks like it just comes to a point, which obviously it doesn't. So it's always nice to think about um, creating that third dimension in that perspective. Lead room is the space in front of the person. That's why I was talking about with the angles. So you don't want um, to have it too close, the head too close to the edge, so the nose gets cut off if they turn that direction. Also, you just need space. It's called breathing space uh, in front of a person. And then the headroom, you want sufficient headroom. In this photo, it's a little more of headroom for her, but we also in, ha had to include headroom um, here as well. The, the kind of, the rule is, you know, if, you, um, if your subject has an apple, or to have an apple on the top of his or her head, then you could fit that apple in the screen or less. You don't want more than the size of that apple on top of the person's head, basically. I'm gonna play a quick video from, well, this one's, yeah, this one's pretty quick. Um, and it is from the uh, PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Lab series. And it's about focusing your camera
So all of these videos that I'm showing you are available in PBS Learning Media, so which is free to you. And um, if you use my slideshow, you can just go straight to those. At the end, I have a list of resources, some that I don't use in this presentation, but things that can help you as you work with your students um, in video production projects. Another thing I want to talk about is the composing the shot. Um, actually, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to send it back. I believe it's Frank again talking about it. No, it's Steve. Steve Schaefer, um, he's going to talk, tell you about how to um, frame your shot. The thing about digital, good digital photography is that it's just good photography. The digital part has very little to do with it. Either, you know, it's, there are good images or they're not because, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of um, people that feel like you, because it's digital, you can do anything in the world to it. And that's true to a degree, but it, um, good fundamentals still apply. And a couple of good fundamentals, you know, that I try to live by and don't always succeed, but most of the time is, um, is to fill the frame and to get, you know, as close to your subject as you possibly can, you know, don't leave dead space. Don't put people in the center of the frame and leave space on either side. There's a famous photographer named Robert Kappa who had a quote that said, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're probably not close enough. All right. So I think it's good to hear from the experts out there. I, I'm not an expert. I just, just try to teach it. So uh, I'm trying to include as much information, especially when I can't be in the media lab with students where we're doing, or teachers, and we're doing this together. Um, it's a lot, it's kind of a, it's kind of tricky for me to do this uh, virtually. All right, so uh, the types of shots that you will use. A wide shot um, is where you're gonna pull out and have more of the scene. And there are two reasons to use a wide shot. One is to establish a setting. So as you're thinking about writing your script, um, the, imagine that you're going to do a virtual tour of the school, right? Uh, or your students are going to have a virtual tour of something uh, that's going on in your community. And you would want to first establish where that was. So a wide shot helps establish the setting. And every time you change the setting, you really should establish that shot. Um, or establish that setting with a wide shot. And you can also cover action with that. So um, the wide shot is a wide frame. You don't have to pull all the way out to have a wide shot, but pretty much the whole body is uh, included in the wide shot. Then you have a medium shot, which is a, can be a little below the waist and up or above the waist and up. And it's all about getting information about someone or something through a host. So it's in this case, it's two people. So it's a medium two shot and maybe they are best friends and they're telling a funny story. Um, sometimes it could be maybe we have um, a person who is holding up a new type of technology so the person is sharing the technology with us. It's not about him or her, it's about this thing. Or maybe somebody's holding up a book. Um, or maybe somebody's standing in front of school saying, come inside, let's go in and have a look around. So all of this is very uh, important on a medium shot to relay information. The news is shot on a medium shot as well. Uh, sometimes you will have interviews in which you have different types of shots of your subject as you're interviewing him or her, but most of the time a medium shot is used for an interview as well. And then we have a close-up shot in which um, really the, the person who's talking, um, everything about him or her, that we're not focused on anything else. In this case, he's kind of looking away, but we're getting an expression. Um, so this, it's the main source of information. It's pretty direct. And it's the head and shoulders or the head, shoulders, and chest is a close-up shot. And then we get an extreme close-up that is really more about emotion um, or details. You also see it a lot in um, commercials. Maybe they're trying to sell you life insurance or something but uh, or mascara. So you have an extreme close-up. But a lot of times in school productions or in even KET productions, our extreme close-ups are used 
to get across an emotion it's because we really identify most with each other by how we feel um so and you can see that mostly in the face then we have angles there's a high angle looking down um, which makes your subject look more vulnerable um, smaller weaker and then there is the low angle looking up which can make the subject look more um, maybe older taller uh, more authoritative um, so angles are very important for telling your story as well And um, I like to talk about stop motion and demonstrate it, and I don't have a way to demonstrate that today. But um, stop motion animation, if you've watched any of Tim Burton's films like Nightmare Before Christmas, um, Corpse Bride, those were created with stop motion animation. I'm going to show you an example of a KET stop motion animation in a second. But basically what you do is you have to have, you can use a still camera, or a video and you have to use a tripod a tripod is or some way of securing your camera is very important handheld you're going to start moving around and it's not going to be very um, consistent so you want to have your camera secure and a lot of times it's fun to create a little set out of a shoebox or something and then have action figures or play-doh in this case i think they're using felt and construction paper but um, you have the the set and then the camera you hit record or take a photo and then you move an object and then take a photo or a video and then you move the object so you don't want to show the person moving the object, basically. I'm going to show this, and then we'll talk more about that. And this, again, is where Sarah and Allison, at the beginning, were talking about storyboards. And I hope this isn't the same one. So planning for a stop animation is very important, and uh, something that Alice and I do is storyboarding. And storyboarding is basically just writing out what you're going to be doing. We use a worksheet that has squares and lines. Okay, I think that's the same one I've already shown you. Here, this is the one I meant to link to, sorry. The skills to be able to do a stop animation um, are patience, you need to be organized, um, you need to be able to do research on the topic that you're going to be animating. I think all those skills are important if you want to have a good stop animation. Having students animate cycles and processes is really a natural for stop motion because um, a lot of times it's some, a concept that you can't just take video of quickly, but in the process of doing a stop motion, you can quickly show each step. Um, and some of the ones that Sarah and I have done two actually of shown cycles like we did the food chain and that was really successful a good example that i've seen of stop animation used in the classroom is illustrating the water cycle um, and you know i think it's an interesting way for students to understand the concepts of the water cycle by doing it as stop animation it's very visual it's hands-on you know they're going over the concepts over and over again by doing the animation so i think it was a very creative way of doing it okay so I'm glad that was on um, a suggestion on the slide because I had linked to the wrong one. But this is um, stop motion. You saw it happen a little bit there. Um, I, I like the idea of using it to for students to tell or teach processes and share with each other. I think that's a really great summer project in which they're actually doing a little bit of their own research to put all of this together uh, and then working in teams. So oh, when you're, oops, when you are creating stop motion, once you have completed all of your videography, once you've captured all the photos or the videos, because you can use video too, um, once you've captured all that, then it's time to edit it. And let's say we're using iMovie. So iMovie would be 10 frames per second. So for every second of video, you need 10 of these shots, okay? So that's gonna take um, some math. So the first thing you would do in creating a stop motion is actually, it's a little backwards, you would incorporate audio. So you're gonna record the audio first, your character voice or whatever, and then you're going to time that. So maybe let's keep it easy. 
and this is long, but maybe the first person to talk in your stop motion animation has a 10 second sentence or statement. So 10 seconds is kind of a long time to talk in a stop motion, but let's just keep it simple. So for that 10 seconds, you're gonna have to have 10 frames for each second. So you're gonna have to have 100 shots to fill that. And the reason why you would want to use the audio first is simply so that you can fill it with video. If you're using a higher end um, editor, like um, some of the free ones out there that are really good um, are like HitFilm or DaVinci Resolve, they have free tiers, but they're higher end. Uh, those can go up to 60 frames per second. So, and that's gonna be a lot smoother um, but how you would do that is when you get into the editor, you would go in and you would highlight all of your shots. You can trim off any shakiness or whatever you don't want and highlight them or yeah, highlight them all, select them all, and then go into the settings. And in iMovie, it would be 0.1. You would change each of those frames to 0.1 of a second. And that's how you can keep it very smooth and um, looking really good. Are there any questions so far? I haven't really stopped for any questions. No, there aren't any questions right now. Okay. There's also green screen. Um, and in this, we are using Do Inc., which is um, an app that goes only on Apple devices, unfortunately. But uh, green screen, you can use that in other ways. There are lots of ways to grab gr uh, green screen. So I'm going to show a little video about it. And this is from our Media Arts Toolkit, actually. You've probably heard of green screen, but do you know how it works? Green screen technology is used all the time. Many news programs use it. Blockbuster movies do too. Green screen is when you film an actor or object in front of a bright green backdrop and replace the backdrop with a different image. This happens by using the chroma key effect. Green screen is a fun tool to make your videos more interesting. Here are a few easy steps to get you started. First, you need a green backdrop. You can use green fabric or paint a wall green. Whatever you use, make sure it's a smooth, non-reflective, solid green color. No wrinkles or shadows. Lighting is very important as well. The lighting for green screen needs to be as even as possible. Make sure to light the backdrop first, then light your actor. Is your actor moving in front of the green screen? Then make sure that you bump up the shutter speed on your camera to 70 to 80 frames per second to avoid blur. Props are great to use with green screen. They can help the actor and make the green screen seem more real. Just make sure your props aren't green. Oh, and don't forget, you probably don't want your actors wearing green either, unless you want this to happen. Just follow these easy tips, and the green screen possibilities are endless. I love that video. I love it, love it. I love seeing all those kids. Um, you can use a blue screen, too. Uh, let's talk, talk about that for a second. Some people ask, well, why green? Well, green is the farthest from human skin. Um, so that's why they use green, but blue is useful too because if you're outdoors and you want to incorporate the foreground, which uh, a lot of times is green grass, uh, then you would use a blue screen so that you could still see the grass. Uh, it's important to keep your fabric tight so that you don't have any like folds or creases in it. That's another thing. You can also get um, a paint, a green screen paint. Um, I think it's called Alien Green, actually, um, but they sell it at places like Walmart. So if you wanted to paint a wall. And if you wanted to use something on a miniature level, like making a stop motion animation, and you wanted to be able to change the backdrop, then paint that, paint your shoebox, your backdrop green, and then you can change, um, you can use green screen for your stop motion. We do green screen workshops in uh, the Media Lab as well. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Media Lab since I'm on that subject. Um, right now it's all virtual Media Lab uh, workshops. So we can't 
do all of the the topics, but we have added some that we couldn't or we didn't do before. But hopefully, um, maybe later next fall, maybe next spring, we will be able to uh, pull back to where we have students and schools coming to the media lab um, for field trips where you can get your travel reimbursed and also have a workshop and a tour. So hopefully that will start back again. But the green screen is one of those topics and we use um, do Inc. We have a classroom set of iPads so the students get to explore that and, and learn together. Oh, I clicked on the wrong thing. Hang on. All right, so another example of using the green screen in the classroom was given to me by Kathy Davis. And Kathy, since, are you still on here? I think she might have left, yeah. but anyway. Yeah, I, I've been here, Cynthia. I'm sorry, I couldn't find that new button. <laughs> do you wanna do you wanna talk about this since you sent this activity to me that you worked with teachers in okay. Portland, right? Yes, yeah, that'll be great. Uh, I was working with a group of high school teachers at Corbin Independent High School one day uh, doing green screen with them and I turned them loose to do a hands on activity and they wanted to work because high school teachers, you know, they tend to. Well, they focus on their curriculum, like the English teachers wanted to work together. The math teachers wanted to work together and so the language arts teachers wanted to or the the arts humanities teachers wanted to work together. So they came up with this idea and like, I gave them like 30 minutes. They came up with the idea and actually created this probably in 30 minutes. And they said that they were going to introduce this painting to their class and put it up like this and see if the kids noticed that this wasn't the actual painting. They took the, pe the, the real people in the painting out and put themselves in. So as you guys can see, the lady holding the umbrella, the guy laying on the ground, there's one in the background, if you guys can see in the red shirt. Uh, the most obvious one, of course, is the lady there in the, in the very front in red. Uh, she kind of stands out. If it wasn't for that one, I'm not sure that the students would have even have picked up on it. But anyway, then they were going to have their students to create something like this with one of their favorite arts and stuff. So, I was just thoroughly impressed that they came up with this concept and carried the concept out probably in the 30 minutes that I gave them. So I use this in my workshops because I just think they did a fabulous job. Yeah, it's cool. I like Shura Shura too. It's a, that's a nice, uh, that's really nice that they did that. Um, also with doing, just so that you know, uh, it is a paid app. I think it's, I think it's now $4.99 each, um, but there's another part component, which is animation. And you can actually create animations that go in on another layer on top in the green screen, which um, is, is really nice too. So, um, but anyway, Kathy shared that with me and I thought uh, that was great. And I'm glad you were here to tell about it, Kathy. All right, um, yeah. let's talk about any other any questions, any comments? Anybody have anything you want to share? We're going to move into um, getting into audio in a second, but before we do, um, I do need to talk about interviews. Renee has a really good uh, information here about interviewing, um, and then I'm going to show you a B-roll um, clip as well. But the main thing I want to talk about with interviews is do not give your subject the list of questions ahead of time, uh, because then just like I would do this, uh, I'm going to rehearse what I want to say, and then it's going to look more scripted. You want it to be natural. You want it to look like a conversation. You want it to be engaging, not feel like, oh, I'm going to use bigger words than I usually use, or, uh, you know, I don't want it to be awkward. So that's that's probably the most important tip that I have to give about interviews. Now I'll let professional Renee. Don't, don't ask close ended questions. That's the one thing you want your questions to be very open. So instead of saying, um, I hear you like soccer. Yes. Well, if they're a soccer player, yeah. 
you know? So you, you, you want to ask almost, I don't want to say leading questions, but you want them, you want to ask very open, rounded questions that kind of get them to open up. So it's not just a simple yes or no. Um, I would also discourage having those long questions where you're reciting their whole history, you know, um, save all that, you know, perhaps if you're doing like a newscast kind of thing, then that can be set up separately. But when you're talking to somebody, you don't have to prove to them that you've done your homework. They, the person who's being interviewed assumes that if you're in the role that I'm in, you know what you're doing, right? So you don't have to prove anything. So keep your questions short and listen. I think that's the biggest thing that people get caught up in is having a clipboard or an iPad these days full of questions, you know, and they're listening and they're watching their questions and they're listening and they're going to the next thing. You have to put that aside sometimes. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll type everything out, but then when I get into the moment, I want it to be organic. And sometimes the conversation isn't just what you plan for them to talk about. Sometimes it goes somewhere you never thought it would go, but yet it becomes a very meaningful conversation. And they feel that too. They feel that you're, that you're not just trying to get something out of them that everybody else gets, right? You know, that you're allowing them to go places. Maybe they haven't touched on a particular subject or said a certain story. And so I think the organic nature of it, don't be so tied in to the questions you have on your paper or iPad that you can't focus and listen in and follow up and really listen. You know, don't, um, sometimes it's easy to zone out. If you're doing something for 30 minutes with somebody, you know, there are times you're like, oh, I just like drifted off there for a moment. Well, you know, get, collect yourself, come back and say, well, I want to pick up on something you said earlier, you know, and so really listening intently to what they're saying, because sometimes they'll say things that aren't complete thoughts that, you know, maybe it's an inside thing that the rest of us don't quite understand. You know, make sure you're listening to make sure that the people who don't know who this person is understands them the way you think you do. I really like how she talks about the, um, it's natural where you sometimes can tune somebody out while they're talking. And I think that is so important to talk about with students, you know, so we do that. It's natural. It's human nature. Um, and, and her um, suggestion of, well, let's back up to something you said earlier to really help get you back on track without letting people know that you stop listening. All right. And then B roll. So the A roll is the actual interview where Renee was talking with um, her guest. And so the B roll is really where the story is told because you don't want to just watch two talking heads. Uh, and actually, I'm just, I'm, don't want to say any more. I'm just going to let um, Jordan from PBS Learning Media uh, student or PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs talk about that. What's up, Student Reporting Labs? I'm Jordan Beasy, your SRL mentor, and today we're going to talk about an element of filmmaking that's crucial to proper storytelling, B-roll. Here are the five things that you need to know about B-roll. Number one, you need it. No, seriously, don't be fooled by its name. Even if you think you don't need B-roll, you do. B-roll should never be a low priority. In fact, it should be thought of as the action of your story. Think of it like this. If your voiceover tells you the story, your B-roll shows you the story. Without it, you pretty much just have a bunch of talking heads, which is boring. So what is B-roll? Well, in television or film production, B-roll is the supplemental footage that's intercut with the main shot. It gets its name from the days of film, where there used to literally be a roll of film with the main shots on it labeled A-roll, and then another roll of film with all the cutaways, action, visuals, and exterior shots on it labeled B-roll. Take a look at this piece on Clark Park in Detroit. The A-roll is the interview with Ziggy Gonzalez. The B-roll is all the other footage you see. Kids playing baseball, hopscotch, and shots of the park itself. In broadcast news, B-roll is what makes you feel like you're there with the person being interviewed. B-roll can sometimes be the most compelling aspect of your news story. For example, look at this story that Alonzo and Tracy Morning High School produced on the ice cream shop Chillin'. The B-roll of the nitrogen hitting the ice cream pulls the audience in, while visually illustrating the sound bite. Nitrogen is just an element that exists uh, in the atmosphere. Um, naturally, it's in the air, makes up about 78% of the air we breathe. Um, we use it in its liquid form, so it's about negative 321 degrees Fahrenheit. You never want to show a shot of someone talking on camera for more than 5 to 10 seconds because audiences have short attention spans. Whenever possible, write your script in a way that incorporates good B-roll. Another reason you need B-roll is because it allows you flexibility during the editing process. 
You can shorten or splice sound bites together without getting a distracting jump cut. Number two, sequences. Whenever possible, try to build a sequence of B-roll. A sequence involves a minimum of three shots of varying types, like a close-up shot, a medium shot, and a wide shot. Sequences are how you set up and introduce a person who the audience will hear a sound bite from. Adeline Baxter is a DC resident who enjoys playing tennis. On the weekends, she comes to the Jenny Dean Park in Sherlington to practice her dribble and her forehand ground stroke. I really like tennis because unlike some other sports where you're kind of waiting for things to happen, you're always running around and you're always working up a sweat. You should always shoot B-roll of any person you interview, even if you don't end up using it. Sequences are also how you convey action in your story. Look at this story about parkour. These series of wide, medium, and tight shots build sequential edits and visually pull your audience into the world of parkour. We can see the action play out in front of us. Remember, sequences don't have to follow a particular pattern, but they do have to tell a story in sequential order. Each time you are in the field, think about what the action is that you're trying to capture, and then shoot a minimum of three shots of that scene. B-roll can also be a great way to pepper in awesome audio to your story. If you see B-roll, you want to hear B-roll, because it adds audiovisual texture to your story. When shooting B-roll, you should always be on the lookout for cool sounds that you can capture. Number three, the rule of 180. The rule of 180 imagines that there is an invisible line of action drawn between a subject and the person that they are interacting with, or an imaginary straight line that's drawn along a path that a subject is moving on. Check out this dialogue scene. Anita and I are talking to one another, with me facing camera right and Anita facing camera left. The camera will always stay on one side of that axis, and the subjects will always stay on the other. If the camera remains on one side of this line, the spatial relationship between the two characters remains consistent from shot to shot. Another example is this action scene. Say I'm moving towards an object like the Lincoln Memorial. During this shot of B-roll, the line of direction applies to my path on the way to the memorial, according to my eye line. If I'm walking in a leftward direction and am to be picked up by another camera, I must exit the first shot on frame left and enter the next shot frame right. If I leave the right side of the frame in one shot, I should enter from the left side of the frame in the next shot. Leaving from the right and entering from the right creates a similar sense of disorientation. This brings me to the fourth thing that you need to know about B-roll, which is the importance of anticipation. I see you shiver with anticipation. When we are filming action or any type of B-roll that captures movement, instead of trying to follow the action, we always want to anticipate it. For example, if I want to capture these moving cars, I don't want to move my tripod or follow them with the camera through a pan. It's best to set up my shot and then let the cars move in and out of frame. This way your footage will remain clear and concise. You'll be able to easily cut action shots together that are not shaky or disorienting. This rule requires patience and sometimes means that you're going to be waiting for a while to capture what you need. Last but not least, angles. The last thing you need to know about B-roll is that you should try to shoot as many angles as possible to mix up your shot options. It's important to be able to have different types of shots to cut away to during your editing. So when you're in the field, think about shots like low angle shots, ground shots, close up shots of a person's features or their hands, over the shoulder shots and exterior shots. Don't forget to be creative. Each shot should be held for a minimum of 10 seconds. Remember, once your camera's locked down, shoot a minimum of three shots and then move. There you go. Those are the five things that you now know about B-roll. Okay, I think that um, that is a really good video. It is a little higher level um, than if, for those of you who are teaching early childhood, but I think it's a really good way for all of us to understand the importance of B-roll. Um, and then you can take that and teach them about that. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention was the PBS NewsHour uh, Student Reporting Labs. For those of you who teach high school, uh, it's something that you can get involved in. And if you have questions about if you want to do that, you can get your students involved in reporting in the community. Um, then just let us know and we can get you information about that. It's a really good program that teaches students um, important journalism and storytelling techniques. Okay, audio. Audio is 50% of the production. So, um, and it can be the biggest problem of distraction. A lot of times people don't think about audio up front and they go out and grab all their video and then they come in to the edit suite and audio is just terrible. There might be the sound of 
the wind hitting um, the microphone on the camera that wasn't properly set up with with a mic um, outdoors uh, or some distracting buzzing light or uh, maybe it's like how I had my outlook still open and I was getting uh, those dings every time I notifications every time somebody emailed me so uh, you got to really think about audio um, besides just the dialogue as well so let's say we are filming um, something outdoors and let's say for example there's a new school in your district and your students want to cover that on their new show um, and so they're t covering the actual construction of it uh, maybe everything is being the building is there the structures there but they're still working on the parking lot and uh, there might be a jackhammer uh, in the background and you don't want to capture that sound because that's a terrible sound and it's going to keep anyone from being able to hear any of the uh, dialogue that you have going on uh, in the scene. So you would want to be out of the frame. Uh, you do not want the actual equipment to be part of your scene or then you would have to add the audio in. So the way to do that is to strip out all of the actual, I said dialogue earlier, but strip out all of the sound. Um, so when you go into editing, you would just detach all that audio and then build it from scratch. Uh, it would probably be best in that situation not to have somebody talking in front of the camera, but to have a, a voiceover or a character voice talking about the scene while we're watching. So um, that would be, and that's pretty easy to do is come in and, and actually just talk over um, video. Nat sound, those are the sounds that you hear in nature. And this is the sound of the room. So every space has its own sound. And if you are filming, let's say, a basketball game, and you've got a camera on one side of the gymnasium, a camera on the other, and one in the middle, and you're going to put all of these videos together and to tell the story of the game um, for your newscast, each one is going to have different crowd noises. So you're going to have to pick one of the cameras and use that for the NAT sound and then pull in the video from the other angles to um, tell the visual story. And that way you don't have any kind of seam um, trying to patch the sound. There might be, you know, uh, people in the audience have different make different sounds too. So you're not going to notice where the camera stopped recording and another one started. And that's that's part of the distraction um, that an audio mishap can create. Music. Music has to be, it has to match the tone. Um, it shouldn't be too loud where it drowns out the other sounds that you need. Um, music also, think about copyright. You can use, I think, uh, some districts have sounds abound, um, but you can also create your own that, um, your own music within like GarageBand, uh, which is another session I do in the Media Lab, um, or another music production app, or have music students in your school uh, compose a piece, maybe your intro for your um, piece, whatever your, um, whether it's an electronic tour or uh, a newscast you can have the students compose the music and that way it's more authentic and you can have them record that and edit that in an audio post which is part of editing sound effects in foley art that is also audio post um, those are created by foley artists um, and a lot of times in today's editors we have the capability of pulling in sound effects that are already part of the editor but um, that can also be created in processing uh, with GarageBand or another music production or sound production software. Um, maybe it's Logic or Pro Tools. But uh, those are the four types of audio that you add in audio post to a video. Now, the dialogue, of course, is recorded as the video is being recorded. So you can keep that and then add this to it. Any questions about audio types? So audio production tips. Um, first of all, it is good if you can use an external mic to plug in an external mic. 
Um, you can get mics for devices. Uh, you can get adapters for mics or buy mics that plug in with whatever lightning or whatever USB-C. Um, so you can purchase those. Uh, but it's very important to have a mic if you can. If you can't, get as close as you can to the subject and then zoom out to have a proper uh, um, type of shot that you need. I'm going to play a video from our, um, oh, no, this is actually uh, a handout that was created by uh, our Roger Tremaine, who was a KET audio engineer. Uh, he's no longer at KET, but this is such good information. Uh, it's good for you if you want to go in and read more about it. Um, so I, I wanted to show that. But then here is the do's and don'ts. And this is a video I wanted to show you. And it's, again, part of the Student Reporting Labs series. Hey SRL! As a news producer, I'm definitely a stickler about recording good audio. You might be wondering, why is audio in video and film production so important? Well, if you record good audio with questionable video quality, like what we're doing right now, your footage is at least usable. If you capture awesome video but end up with poor quality audio, well, that's pretty much a deal breaker. So what are the best practices for capturing high quality audio? Well, you want to listen closely to our top do's and don'ts of audio production. Do monitor your sound. Whether you are on set or out in the field, your audio is constantly changing. Just like your lighting, you need to monitor it. That's why you should always have headphones that you can plug into your camera or external audio recorder in order to listen to the changing factors of your environment. Monitoring your audio channels helps you make sure that you can capture great audio from different sources. Do take control of your shoot. Disagree with his views. This is an interview I shot at Wauwatosa West High School in Wisconsin. We were filming in a hallway, but suddenly the bell rang and class let out. My opinion, I just found it questionable, um, such as like bringing back waterboarding and other things like that. We just kept rolling when I really should have stopped and waited for the noise to die down. If you think you're capturing poor quality audio, speak up. By speaking up, you'll be able to pause and wait for noise to go away potentially change your microphone placement if necessary, or reconsider where you're filming altogether. You'll be grateful for it later. Do use a windscreen on your microphone. Let's listen to this example. It changes the roles of people in society and it can affect like the roles of people's like jobs and everyone's lives and it affects the way people think and form opinions. You can easily tell from this clip that the wind outside was a significant challenge for capturing audio. It's hard to hear what the student is saying. In situations like this, you can improve your audio by putting a windscreen on your mic. This is also known as a dead cat. Another nice trick is to tape your microphone inside your shirt, under your clothes, so that the mic is shielded from the wind. Do capture natural sound. When you're filming B-roll, audio, or natural sound, can add layers and texture to your story. Here, have a listen. Every morning, nearly 100 women at this garment factory in Monrovia begin their workday with song. Liberian women wake up, they sing, you are the leaders of the nation. Every evening on the south side of the Hawaiian island of Kauai, just as the sun is about to set, a curious noise cuts through the tropical breeze. That's the sound of parakeets. In these examples, the correspondent writes their voiceover to incorporate the natural sound that they captured. They are able to build sound into the script of their pieces, making their stories come to life. When you are out in the field, look around you and think, are there sounds around me that tell my story? Does my subject interact with anyone? Or do work that I can see? What does that work or action sound like? Capturing those types of sounds will be the most valuable thing when you edit audio later because it allows you to fill gaps in your sound bites or voiceover. Do ask your subject to speak clearly and slowly. When you place a microphone on your subject, make sure your subject talks for a while before you record. 
Ideally, you want to hear them speak for 30 seconds to a minute, so you can adjust the audio if they sound too loud or too low. This is called getting an accurate level. I notice a lot of students ask their subjects yes or no questions to get a level. But if you ask an interesting question that gets your interview subject talking, that gives you more time to get a good level. Now that we've talked about the do's, let's tackle the don'ts. Don't record near objects that emit distracting noises. Noise can be a hum, a buzz, a hiss, or an echo. A lot of objects emit sounds that might sound unnoticeable to you, but your microphone will definitely pick them up. For example, a refrigerator makes a low hum when it's plugged in. It sounds like this. Similarly, air conditioning vents or fans are very noisy and can often turn on and off throughout your shoot. Some locations are really challenging to shoot B-roll and interviews because of external audio conditions. Are you filming in a noisy place with lots of people? Are you filming on a windy day? Are you filming next to the highway? Beginners can find it scary or even stressful to stop an interview when they detect an audio issue or conflicting sound. So here we are today at the Great but if it's basically impossible to hear your audio source, it's crucial to let your fellow producers and subjects know while you're in the field so that you can fix whatever interference you're having. Don't hold the mic too close to your mouth. If you do, your sound will become distorted. The result is audio that sounds boomy and bassy. Make sure your levels don't go over negative 12 decibels. If you see your levels peaking in the red zone, that means your sound is distorted. Don't let your subject move around during your recording. People like to move around when they talk. It's human nature. But sometimes when your subject is animated, their clothing can shift or their hair and hands can rub against the mic, causing audio interference. It sounds like this. It's a really dark story. It's like basically like her, I don't even know why. It has no rhyme or reason to like why she's given this curse. So remember to listen to your audio for interferences and remind your subject to stay still. Finally, we here at SRL wanted to leave you with one last don't. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes are always learning experiences. So get creative and have fun with your audio. Okay, so I wanted to, um, and the refrigerator reminded me, one of the tips that Roger um, shows in this document that um, is available from this link right here, was uh, for the refrigerator. If you're if you're inside, and sometimes the students' projects might involve them filming in each other's houses, and the refrigerator is um, making a humming noise or a buzzing noise. Uh, Roger said, what he does is unplug the refrigerator, and he would put his keys or something he needs inside the refrigerator so that he will remember to plug it back in because you don't want to leave somebody's refrigerator unplugged. Um, but I think that those are all really good tips. Uh, I do recommend looking at different types of mics too. Uh, now, for the most part, you're just going to use probably the mic that's on the device that's being recorded, but an, an Omni mic, one that picks up the sound from all around is, is probably the most practical that you would use for school projects. Um, and then sometimes with remote shoots, uh, you have different challenges and I'm gonna let Prentice talk about that for you. When I'm assigned as the uh, lighting technician, uh, when we're on remotes, uh, there are several people uh, that usually are involved in this. You have a videographer, which his or her main job is to create the image uh, that the producer or director uh, needs. Uh, then you have an audio technician who is in charge of the actual audio recording, uh, making sure that that's correct, the balance levels, uh, making sure there's no distortion, um, and then you have sometimes an AP, associate producer. Uh, an associate producer is someone that makes sure that all of the information is correct in terms of when you're interviewing someone, um, that they have released forms um, to make sure that uh, all the information that they have given us is correct. So it could be up to four or five people uh, on a remote shoot. 
Uh, nowadays, things are streamlined, and you usually have a videographer, maybe if you're lucky, a lighting technician, and an audio technician, and a producer. Um, with that being said, a lot of the things that sometimes slip through the cracks happens when you have a smaller crew. Um, you have people that have to do a variety of things, and usually, you know, that's not the best job. So we try to have as many people as we can going out on a remote because that eliminates the small things that fall through the cracks. And something that is good for going out for remote shoots is having a shot sheet. And so after you've gotten your script ready and you think about where you're going on a location, you don't want to have to go back to that location and try to duplicate it because the it might be a cloudy day, whereas before it was um, a sunny day or you might have people who have different hairstyle or something for that day. So a shot sheet will tell exactly all the shots you need to get while there, uh, a list of who's going and the equipment needed. And that's an important thing too. I remember one time um, we did a shoot in Louisville and we traveled from Lexington and we got there and there wasn't a backup battery. And you can't just, some of these cameras, you can't just go and buy a battery for studio cameras. So. Uh, just having a list and double checking everything before you get into your van or whatever to go to that location is a very important check off. And also that audio person is extremely important, um, not just for monitoring, but also making notes about, well, we're going to have to add this in later because maybe um, in this scene where you removed all of the sound that you recorded or you know you're going to, uh, if there is an airplane or a helicopter uh, going overhead, we want to hear that. If we don't hear it, there's something wrong. Um, so somebody needs to make notes of all of the audio that's going to be added in audio post. And now we're at post post production, which is the video and the audio editing. Um, has anybody, and you can throw it out there in the chat. I don't know. Let me pull up the chat. Has anybody had a chance to um, edit before? And if so, what have you used? I would really like to know uh, who has done any kind of editing. Uh, a lot of people use whatever is on their phone, um, and there are lots of free editors out there that are really good. Um, so video and graphics and character generation, which is the fancy word for titling, and then audio is all happening after you've pulled in, oh, Camtasia, awesome, uh, after you've pulled in all of the video and audio that you've recorded in production. So we're in the final phase of the production, which is a third of it, actually, and that's post. I'm going to let um, Jim talk about video editing. He uh, He's our colorist, um, video, video technical editor at KET, um, and he does the coloring as well. Editing is not a simple start stop process. It's a constant process of evaluating what you've done and how it's working, how it goes through and paring it down to what's really essential to tell the story the way that you want it done. And to do that, you kind of edit the piece over and over and over and over again. So the first part is to just get the baseline of the story. The rough cut is pretty much what we refer to as an A-roll. It's a term from film where you used to have to have things on alternate tracks in order to do transitions from one to the other. The A-roll is the base story. A lot of what we do at KET is a documentary style production segments for Kentucky Life specials that we do. And that means that that story is driven by however long it takes the narrator and the interviews to string together. So you have somebody that sets something up, somebody that talks about what the subject is, somebody that might transition to somebody else talking. So you put those blocks together and see how that works first. And then you try and make sure that that order works and rearrange the order. And then you whittle that down to make it as economical as possible or to, to make sure that it fills the time that you need to for that. And so having edited the story, you then need to illustrate the story. 
So a lot of my job I often think of is, is being an illustrator. I see what they're talking about. I want to make sure that the sound and the pictures reinforce that. Generally in a documentary style, it's a say dog, see dog. If you're talking about chocolate cake, you want to see chocolate cake. You don't want to see a picture of lemon pie because then you're wondering, why am I seeing something that we're not talking about? You can do that if you want to do that to tell a different story in sound and picture. But generally you want to illustrate the pieces that are there. So you edit the story for an A roll and then you edit the story for a B roll and you make sure that that works. And then you edit the story for nat sounds so that it's full and rich with natural stuff. And then you might add multiple audio tracks of music or something that would help set the tone or help set the pacing. So you actually edit video, edit audio, edit music, and then edit it again. Okay. So um, the uh, editing, um, he uses Avid. I'll put that in the notes over here. But one of the things I want to mention was where Jim talked about continuity. And that is something I meant to mention earlier. It is so important to have continuity when you're out filming your production. So again, the clothes that somebody is wearing, you don't want them to have on for the it's same thing. I, I am just now leaving this. Um, so you don't want um, suddenly somebody to appear with a green shirt, whereas yesterday they were wearing a black shirt, but it's still the same scene. So having continuity. Also think about time period pieces, which sometimes you might be doing uh, a historical skit or something and your students want to put together a video about it. Um, make sure that in the scene there, unless it's kind of modernized, that there isn't technology or something that um, kind of conflicts with this time period. Uh, so I also want to talk about graphics because a lot of students are really doing a lot with graphics and there's so much out there. Uh, if you are interested in any kind of graphics or animation, um, blender.org, now this is for um, older students, like middle and high school, blender.org is open source and anybody can use it. It is very complex. It is sophisticated, uh, but it is available out there. If you want to start smaller, then I recommend exploring Tinkercad, uh, which is also free and browser based uh, and getting students familiar with creating in the 3D work plane uh, and actually being able to think about the Cartesian axis and all of that. So I'm going to play some videos from KET's graphics team um, and animation but we'll get back into uh, talking about that in a minute. So this is good device or good device, good advice for graphic design. The first piece of advice that I'd give uh, somebody who's wanting to get into this is just to focus on art classes and design classes. Um, and they don't necessarily have to be um, college classes or, or anything official. I mean, there's plenty of ways you can hop online and take online classes or read books or, or whatever. You can educate yourself. Um, but I think those basic design aesthetics are probably the most important part of it because the software and all the tools, you can be taught that. You can learn that stuff real easy. But having a good eye for what works well on screen and what doesn't, um, that's kind of harder to come by. That's what people really need to need to focus on. And if you get that right, then the rest of it's just, you know, which button do I push? Kinds of issues. It's not. It's not a big deal. Okay. And um, Clark, I think also talks about animation. Um, I'm pretty sure this is Clark as well. He's he's our graphic and animation designer. He's one of them. Uh, well, usually the producers will come to me and, and we'll just talk about the project briefly. And then they'll give me a few days just to to work on researching and, and figuring out where we want to go with it. Um, then we'll meet and look at some of the inspirational ideas. Um, after that, usually we can narrow it down to one or two kind of directions that we want to try. And I'll go back and, and try things and 
put a few things together for a couple of days and present that. And we just go back and forth like that, refining it down further and further until usually within three or four passes, we've got something that everybody's pretty happy with. With the internet, there's so much, uh, so much inspiration available out there. I start searching different things, different video clips, different animations, different styles, uh, just to get an idea. And I try to match up whatever the project is. I try to match up something that kind of feels right with that uh, stylistically. Um, and it's, it's not that hard. The hard part is narrowing it down a lot of times because you can be overwhelmed with way too much stuff. So I've got feeling. I probably pick about four or five different things to, to inspire me. And then I'll take those and present those to the producer. And usually in that there's something that'll work and it gives us a, a direction to start moving in. Okay, so again, um, if you have students that are interested in that direction, for younger students, I recommend the stop motion animation to start, but then um, you can quickly jump into uh, Tinkercad. I've used that with first graders uh, and kindergartners, and I also do that uh, for a workshop as well if you're interested. Again, character generation is just a fancy word for titling. And if you have students who are really, really into audio and the way things sound, make them the audio, the Foley artist, make them the audio post person who creates the sound effects. All right, um, this video is about video production careers and I'm gonna let you explore that on your own. I'm gonna take the last few minutes of this for discussion. If you do not have any questions or comments, then we can go back and pick up some videos that I left out. But if you have um, any questions, I know that probably equipment is probably one, um, then just let me know. Let's, let's just open it up for questions. And you're welcome yeah. to unmute yourself and ask the question too. So if you have a question that you would oh, like yeah. Cynthia to help with. So equipment, I'll just go on and start there. And then if, if feel free to interject at any time, I, I like to have interaction. Um, so equipment based, you really need, of course, a camera. <laughs> and a lot of people might be using phones or iPads. You might actually have a camcorder at the school, which is fine. But with that, I do recommend uh, that you have a tripod and, if you can, a mic. Uh, and lighting, you can create lighting naturally, but it would be good. There, um, there are lots of uh, lighting setups on Amazon, like $50 or $60. Somebody have a question? Hi, Cynthia. Mike Oxley here. I've got two questions for you. Okay. Uh, first question, if I have one minute of finished video, how much time do you spend in pre-production, production, and post-production to arrive at that one minute? Oh, wow. Well, it depends on what, uh, how many scene changes. Um, what kind of production are you thinking of? Uh, I'm thinking of an explainer. Of an explainer, like a demo? Yep. Okay, so you're going to have a few, you're going to have a process, right? Uh, yep. And you're going to, okay. Um, for a minute, I would say it might take a, a half hour total. Um, for pre-production, I, I mean, I actually would probably put 10 minutes on each part. Okay. Uh, second question is, uh, you spoke briefly about the attention span of a potential audience. Uh, the, the length of a video that an audience can can handle. Uh, as low as two minutes, as high as 10, 15 perhaps? Yeah, I probably wouldn't go um, any higher than seven, actually, especially so if you're much. just getting started. Yes. Um, even with our work, like these these video clips I've been showing you, some of them actually got into six minutes. But um, what we do for students and what we're 
of creating our very small segments because we know that nobody wants to sit through a long video. So to start now, if you if you're making a series like uh, you know a drama series, then yeah, you could go for half hour to an hour. But to get started, I want seven minutes. Okay, good information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have colleagues on here who might want to share more um, opinions. Uh, really, I'm just speaking on my own experience, but there are others who are more experienced on here. So if you have any answers, like Larry, <laughs> Kathy. All right. Any other questions? Well, I, I was going to say, Cynthia, I, I think you're pretty right on it when you're doing an explainer or something like that. This is Larry, by the way. Uh, but as you said, it really depends on the com the complexity of your production uh, and how much uh, scripting and everything has to be done prior. Uh, and if you're shooting on location or if you're shooting, you know, so as you know, there's a lot of variables and the more variables you throw into it, the longer it's going to take. So that that's the, the I think the big thing to think about is just that the more variables you have, the more things you have to kind of sit down and think through and just. I, I think my big takeaway is is don't slack on the pre-production part of it. That's what too many people do is they don't plan sufficiently. It's kind of like you were talking about not having a, a battery when you got to uh, to Louisville uh, trying to use that. Uh, a little bit of pre-planning can really help in the end uh, to have a much smoother production. And I was gonna, I'm just going to say one thing kind of to the side, but uh, I don't think I heard it in the presentation, and I think it's a an important thing on the sound issue, and that is grabbing some nat sound when it is fairly low level and quiet. So if you know you're going to be outside on location and you're going to be shooting where there might be planes going over and things like that at different times, make sure, and the, our audio guys always do this, I think, always grab just some good natural sound with just the birds chirping and low level stuff. And then when you go into your post-production editing, you can always throw that sound in, just that good gnat sound in, maybe in a spot where there was some kind of interrupting noise or something that you could, if you can separate that out, lay that low level sound in instead, it doesn't sound like there's just a vacancy of sound, which sounds weird when there's no sound there other than the person talking. If you have that gnat sound in behind, it kind of ties the shots together. So that was just kind of an audio tip that I think is a pretty important one. That's good. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? Um, somebody's asking if this will be available to view later, and I believe it has uh, been recorded. Uh, Holly can confirm that. That's the plan. Yes, we have. Um, uh, we are planning on putting it up um, on our KET Education YouTube page. So I will send out the information about where you can find that page. Um, it may be a week or so before this all gets um, edited and finalized in order um, for it to be posted. But that is the plan that you will be able to find it on the KET Education YouTube page. And 